Everyone thought he was a useless idiot, but he turns out to be the strongest hero who is pretending to be normal and immediately creates a harem. Alan used to be the strongest hero, but he got tired of saving worthless humans at the expense of his personal life. So when he was about to die, he made a wish to the goddess weeping beside him that he wants to live like a normal man in his next life. His wishes come true, and he becomes the loser son of a duke. One fine day, he wakes up in his bedroom as his younger brother comes banging on his door, and tells him that their father wants to meet them. His dad immediately starts insulting Alan, telling him that he is still a level 1 loser even after so many years, and his stats have not increased in the least. On top of that, he did not even get any divine gift from God like other noble children. He then kicks Alan out of the family, claiming that he is a failure and a blot on his family's name. Alan gets out of the castle, completely unfazed as he was waiting for this moment so that he can spend this life having fun and not worrying about other people, but realizes that he still has his powers from the last life. Just before he could go wander around, he hears a girlish screaming coming from a distance. It turns out to be two girls who are being attacked by some monsters. The tomboy knight Betty tries to slash and stab the dog monsters, but even as she shatters them to pieces, they immediately heal back up. She tells the princess named Lisa to run away while she blocks the dog monsters, but the princess is adamant about not leaving her behind. So she simply stands behind her while Betty tries her best to keep the monsters at bay. Alan watches it from a distance by using his magical eyes, and remembers how when they were young, some men at a party were making fun of him for being useless. But Lisa stepped in and told those men that at least he tries. This makes him want to help her in this situation just as the incompetent warrior woman falls. One of the dogs slashes her body, leaving her knocked out on the ground. The monsters are just about to finish the job, but Alan musters all of his magical energy and runs faster than lightning to appear in front of the princess at the very last moment, grabbing the dog by its throat. Lisa is shocked as Alan attacks the three monsters before jumping in the air and scanning them. He finds out that they all have a core inside of them, so he uses his special ability that creates a bunch of ethereal swords around him and throws them at the dog monsters, completely obliterating them. Betty apologizes to Lisa for being incompetent and thinks that this is the end for her. However, Alan approaches her and uses his healing magic to heal her completely and even restores her armor. This really shocks the girls as everyone knew that Alan was a useless loser without any power. He can't tell them that these are powers from his previous life, but the girls come to a conclusion that this must be a new type of divine blessing the church doesn't know about. He then asks Lisa what the hell is she doing out in the countryside, and she explains that while she was praying to the goddess, she received a prophecy that she needs to go to a faraway village to help the hero. There was no other detail, and she left the capital alongside Betty who was one of the strongest female warriors and her bodyguard. Lisa then asks Alan what is he doing here, and he replies that they should talk about that while resuming their journey. He gets up and fixes the carriage using his healing magic. While traveling through the countryside, Lisa learns that he was kicked out by his dad for being powerless. Now, he simply wants to live a normal life away from fame and people. She pities him, and even refuses to snitch him out to the king despite knowing how helpful his powers can be to the kingdom. Alan thanks her and promises to accompany her while she is roaming through the countryside in search of the hero. After a while, they finally reach the village that she was looking for, and surprisingly enough, they don't find any monsters roaming around the area, which is very rare. They walk around the village, but it looks empty until they finally see a horde of people, while a girl gets kicked out of an old man's house. This flat-chested girl turns out to be Akira, who is the current hero, and holds the all-powerful sword that once belonged to Alan in his previous life. Akira doesn't even recognize Lisa, and asks them to take her out to lunch first because she is hungry. While inside a restaurant, they start eating, and Akira tells them that she was wandering around the village, when she spotted a young girl running through the woods. She grabbed her and asked if she was fine, but she claimed that the dragon was going to eat her. Hearing this, she decided to slay the dragon, and hid the girl in a small cave, before heading into the village to get some more information. But when she entered the old man's house to ask questions, he refused to talk, and threw her out. Alan finds all of this a bit suspicious, and theorizes that there is a possibility that these villagers are trying to sacrifice the girl's life in order to gain protection from the dragon. 
and that's why they can't see any monsters around the area. This theory makes sense to all of them. So Akira decides that she is going up the hill and slaying the dragon by herself. Lisa immediately volunteers to go with her, as according to the prophecy she needs to guide the hero, and Betty obviously follows Lisa. Alan takes a deep breath as he can't leave his friends alone, so he decides to go with them in case they get overpowered by the dragon. While climbing up the hill, Akira seems to be very confident in her abilities, and draws up a plan, claiming that she will go straight up and face the dragon, while the others should go around the mountain and pincer the monster. Alan knows that this hero is completely useless and will get destroyed, so he offers to go from the front alone, while the girls go around the mountain. However, Akira can tell that he is more powerful than he shows, and he might kill the dragon without letting her fight. That is why she wants to go from the front, and then requests to spar with him once she is done with the dragon. Alan agrees to the plan, and Akira ends up going straight up to the dragon who immediately gets up and shoots a massive flame blast at her. She dodges it somehow, and uses her special abilities to cast lightning on the dragon. But her magic is so weak that it simply tickles the dragon as he laughs at her face. Suddenly the dragon shows her that the little girl is also here, and reveals that he simply wanted to have fun terrorizing the villagers, that is why he released her on purpose. This pisses Akira off, and she musters all of her strength and rushes in with a lightning attack, slashing the dragon cleanly before posing like a hero. But when she turns around, she finds the dragon completely unharmed. He laughs and slaps her into oblivion which completely incapacitates her as she lies on the ground, waiting for the dragon to finish her. Thankfully, Alan comes to her rescue and slashes one of the dragon wings cleanly, knocking the dragon down. He then tells the girls to get out of the area, while the dragon charges at him with full speed, but Alan simply uses his magic attack to throw an aerial slash which hits the dragon and stops him in his tracks. The dragon is very confused as he is the Red Dragon King, the strongest dragon in the world, but Alan immediately scans him and is ready to deliver the final blow. But the dragon starts running away like a coward, before jumping on top of the girls. He promises to kill them if Alan takes a step further, but Alan doesn't give a shit and rushes in with a strike, penetrating the dragon with his sword, and unleashing his ultimate move that completely destroys the dragon. Everyone rejoices at the victory, and Alan realizes that the girls can't survive a day in this world without his help and decides to delay his retirement till Lisa's work is done. The next morning he wakes up by the tree only to find Lisa staring at him. He then looks around to see the little girl sitting and watching while the hero Akira and Betty are having a sparring match to decide who is the strongest amongst them. Suddenly Alan remembers that yesterday, Lisa used Saint Class healing magic on Akira when she was injured. But Lisa tells him not to divulge this information to anyone else as it is a secret she has been keeping, and Alan promises that her secret will be safe with him. Just then, Akira calls Alan over, claiming that they want to have a sparring match with him as well. Later that day, they all get ready in the wagon, but Akira decides that she wants to wing it alone, and doesn't want to travel in a wagon. Alan asks whether she would be alright, but she promises that she knows how to handle herself, and tells them that she will be taking the girl with her. This makes Alan suspicious so he tells her to beware of FBI, and she goes off on her way. Alan and the rest proceed into the wagon, where Lisa apologizes to Alan because in the last fight against the dragon, his sword broke, and tells him that she wants to go to a nearby village which is filled by degenerates, because her friend called no lives there and forges amazing swords. Alan tells her not to worry about it, but agrees to go into the village regardless. Meanwhile, back at Alan's house, his father and his best brother Karen are talking about how their plan failed. It turns out that it was them who sent the monster dogs to attack the princess, as well as they made a deal with the dragon to kill the hero, as they want to take revenge on the kingdom. Karen starts shouting but his father tells him to shut his mouth up, while he turns his attention towards an old butler-looking dude and tells him to get more information about the whereabouts of the princess. Back at the village, Alan is shocked to see the area filled with all kind of demi-humans roaming around the area while he finds his way to Noel's house. Inside they find her lying on the floor, which gives Lisa a scare, but it turns out that she was just exhausted after working all night. Lisa heals her back up, and afterwards asks her to make a sword for Alan, but she outright refuses, claiming that she has a lot of customers who want their swords polished and fixed urgently. She then asks what happened to his original sword, which Alan then shows to her. 
She looks at him with disgust and claims that she can never forge a weapon for a guy who can't take care of it. Lisa tells her to check it once, so she uses her special abilities to see how it broke, and realizes that this sword was used perfectly to its full potential, and only then did it break. This changes her mind, and she agrees to do the job for him, and then kicks all of them out, so she can work in peace. After that the three of them decide to go inside the town to get a lodge to stay at night. But it turns out that a girl wearing a very dumb dress has been spying on them, who turns out to be working for the old butler guy. She tells him about what she saw, but he is confused because there is supposed to be only one useless female guard with Lisa, and not another guy. After spending the day in the town, Alan decides to sell the dragon scales that he scavenged at the Adventurer's Guild. A bit sad, Alan walks down to the Adventurer's Guild, and goes over to the counter only to find another furry receptionist. He gives over the dragon scale to her, and asks her to trade it for money, but this thought has never seen a red dragon scale in her life, and starts shouting like crazy. This attracts the attention of the old butler alongside the lowly, who go up to Alan, and the butler starts asking how he got the scale. Alan tells him that him and his party had a fight with the Red Dragon King and were able to win it and that's why he got the scale. The butler uses his skills to check his level and realizes that Alan is a level 1 loser, so he asks whether the hero was in his party. Alan truthfully replies saying that the hero was in their party and together they defeated it. Butler seems to be satisfied by it and wanders outside, where he tells the lowly that the guy is a complete nerd who can't even cut his own steak, let alone kill a dragon. But the lowly is still apprehensive, and claims that she feels like he is hiding something. The next morning, Alan and party go back to Noel's place to check up on her, only to find her down on the ground unconscious once again. Lisa helps her back to consciousness, while she tells Alan that his sword is ready. Alan picks up the slender blue blade and claims that it definitely is one of the best swords that he has ever seen, and immediately the thirsty elf starts telling him that she wants him to try it outside. Lisa immediately puts a stop to it, forcing Noel to rest before doing anything. But after that they head outside into the forest to try and slay some monsters. On the way they start talking and Alan asks Noel why is she a swordsmith as it is usually done by dwarves. Noel tells him that it is because she lost her family when she was a young elf, and while wandering through the forest, she ended up being saved by a dwarf named Vanessa who was more manly than you. Vanessa then took care of her. But then an unfortunate accident happened, and she lost her forever. Before she could explain further, the butler showed up once again with the lowly inside the forest for no reason, and started asking whether he is here to kill monsters. But Alan tells him to stop acting like a stalker SSO the butler leaves quickly. Alan goes further and finds some monsters that he easily destroys with his new sword, cutting them to shreds, which seems to be a good enough test for the sword. But this thirsty s Honol is still not satisfied, and claims that they should kill some stronger monsters and drags him deeper into the forest. Suddenly Alan stops and uses his magic eyes before using his sword to slash away the magic barrier in front of him to reveal a giant wolf-tiger abomination that gives Noel some post-traumatic Down syndrome as she realizes that this is the thing which killed Vanessa, so she asks Alan to slay it immediately while Alan stands there confused not knowing what the right decision to make is. Noel starts remembering about the past, and how she was horribly neglected when she was young. Even though Vanessa took her back to her home, she hardly ever talked or cared for her, and spent most of her time hitting the blade over and over with a sheer sense of determination in each strike. Noel tried to get Vanessa's attention in every way imaginable, as she shouted her name again and again to no avail and even when she wanted food she would get no response. This pissed her off a little bit so she would go and eat whatever she could find in the house, but even after that she would get the silent treatment from Vanessa who kept beating away at the blade like a clockwork. At last Noel tries to do something really drastic and picked up a sword before losing her balance and falling over all the other tools, but despite that, Vanessa didn't even look at her once to make sure she is okay. She ended up sleeping at the table. And when the next morning came, Vanessa finally completed her blade at last, and only then did Noel see something resembling a smile on her face. Finally she snaps back to reality, and with tea-filled eyes, tells Alan to destroy the creature as he was the one who killed Vanessa. Alan refuses to do anything, as the beast is not trying to harm them, in fact it is far away from human settlement, peacefully sleeping and minding his own business. 
Hearing this, Noel grabs the sword out of Alan's hands, and with clenched teeth, runs towards the beast to land a killing blow, only to be stopped by Alan as he warns her that this will be of no use as the beast has a protective spell around it which doesn't let an attack below a certain level land on it. According to him, they will need a sacred sword if they want to hurt the monster. But Noel tells him that her sword is good enough to be considered a sacred sword. Alan tells her that her sword is nowhere near the level of a sacred sword, and no matter how hard she tries, the blade won't even make a scratch on the beast. After saying that he starts walking away telling her that she could do as she pleases. The next evening he goes back to the town and meets up with Lisa and Betty before telling them the entire story about what just transpired inside the depths of the forest. Lisa is confused about why a great monster would be hiding inside the jungles doing nothing, but Alan claims that he suspects someone intentionally brought the monster in this area as they used a spell around the area which made the beast invisible to naked eye. He then turns towards Lisa and asks her what was the real reason she wanted to come here as he doubts she will come here just to try and create a sword. Lisa smiles embarrassingly before revealing that he is right and they came here to investigate the murder of the general of their army. According to her, the general was a very righteous and good man, but one day, he was found assassinated inside of his own home, with no signs of any intruders and zero evidence apart from the fact that the killer took the general's head with him, leaving the body behind. Betty suspects that this was the work of a demon as no human possesses this skill, but they have no idea why a demon would go out of its way to kill the general so secretively. Meanwhile, inside the forest, the lowly checks up on the monstrous wolf, but is confused how can a normal human being like Alan destroy the invisibility barrier she put so easily. She then heads back to the town to meet up with the butler and gives him the report. The butler claims that this town is boring and he wants to leave, so he tells the lowly to go and kill the princess as well as the elf Noel, which surprises the girl. The butler notices it and walks back to her, telling her that she has no choice as a slave collar appears on her neck. That night, Noel starts working on the blade once again after Alan gave her a bunch of information about what the problems are with the blade, and this time she was determined to produce a blade that could be rivaled by none. She keeps hitting the blade just like Vanessa did, but ends up getting exhausted and sleeps right where she was. In her dreams, she again witnesses the events that transpired that horrific day when their home was attacked by the monstrous wolf, alongside the butler who wanted to remove Vanessa from the earth, just because she was trying to make swords that could rival the sacred treasures. The wolf shoves her through the house as she slides back but manages to stabilize herself before rushing in for an attack, but to her surprise, the moment her blade touched the wolf, it shattered into thousands of places while the wolf tore her apart with her sharp teeth. With blood pouring down his teeth, the monster turns around to finish Noel, but suddenly a huge bolt of lightning shocks him and the hero presents herself in front of Noel. The wolf doesn't really care and tries to attack her, but she shocks the monster once again, which it shakes off as if it was nothing before attacking again. The hero counter-attacks and manages to slash the monster across the face thanks to her sacred sword, which scares the butler enough that he decides to run from the scene. The hero apologizes for not being able to save Vanessa, but Noel is distraught because even after Vanessa put all her hard work in that blade, it simply shattered on impact. She cries her heart out, vowing that she will make a blade which is better than a sacred sword. The next morning she wakes up feeling much better and lighter. She wonders whether Lisa healed her and comes out to check, but finds no one so she gets to her work again, while well, it turns out that Alan healed her at night to make sure she remained healthy. Later that day, she finally finished the sword, and this time confident that the sword was strong enough to compete with a sacred treasure, she wanders out at night all alone to try and kill the monster. She finds the wolf still sleeping and tries to spring up on it, but the wolf senses her and hits her away into a tree. She barely manages to stand up after that when the butler appears commending her for her durability as most people die when hit by the wolf. She once again rushes towards the monster, but with the power of bad animation, the wolf manages to dodge and kicks her in the back. The butler tells her to say her last prayers, but just as the monster was going to kill her, Alan appears in the middle and slashes the wolf away. The butler laughs and tells Alan that this was his plan as it turns out that the lowly was entering the princess's chamber to finish her in her sleep, but finds her bed empty. Immediately Betty and Lisa call her out from behind, as thanks to the barriers put by Alan, they can see through invisibility spell. 
The Loli immediately tries to attack, but Betty intercepts her and after a bit of back and forth, pushes her back. She was about to land the finishing blow, but the princess stops her. And using this to her advantage, the Loli hits Betty on the head and grabs Lisa's arm, but stops right before killing her. The princess realizes that this girl is being forced to fight when Betty hits her on the head and knocks her out cold. Meanwhile, the butler orders the wolf to kill both Noel as well as Alan, but unlike what happened with Vanessa when the wolf attacked Alan, he was able to slice through him without his sword breaking. The wolf dies immediately, and fearing for his life, the cowardly butler immediately runs away. Alan carries Noel back to the city where he meets up with Lisa, and they head up to interrogate the lowly. They end up learning that she was enslaved when the butler raided her village and killed everyone so she had no choice but to work for him as she has no home. This reminds Noel of her own childhood and similar to how Vanessa took her back home, she walks up to the lowly and frees her from her bounds, claiming that she will take the lowly back to her place and that they can live together in her home. This makes her really happy and she starts crying, which solves most of the problems, but Alan is still not done and wants to finish the butler forever. He goes out inside the forest alone once again and uses his special attacks to try and find the butler, but it turns out that while he was hiding behind the mountains, a demon ended up finding him and killed him before leaving the place. It turns out that the orders to kill the butler were given by none other than Alan's father himself, who has hired the demon and is also responsible for killing the general of the kingdom. He tells the demon that he wants to finish the hero, as well as the princess, but his son jumps in between, telling his dad that he wants to deal with the princess's party personally. Meanwhile, Alan and his party are at Noel's workshop. They have been trying to find some leads about the murderers of the general, but no clue has been found till now. Noel suddenly gives Alan an idea, reciting a story about a certain village nearby, where a ghost wearing silver armor appears at night and haunts the graveyard. Betty freaks out on hearing this story because she is terrified of ghosts like a five-year-old, and while everyone is busy teasing her about it, Lisa decides to investigate the ghost story. Alan also agrees because demons may know how to raise people from the dead, and they can find some clues if this story is true. So, that evening, Alan and his party go to the village and find the people there hard at work, preparing for Halloween. Lisa asks the villagers if they have seen a man wearing silver armor around these parts, they have never seen anything like that, and Lisa is disappointed by their answer. Alan says that they should check out the village graveyard too, because Noel mentioned that clearly in her story. They find the graveyard empty, but Betty is fully alert, and as she hears the rustling of leaves, she immediately turns back. She was anticipating an enemy, but all she finds is a man with completely white eyes. They do not suspect anything and follow the man as he leads them to the village chief's house, they meet the village chief, who denies any sighting of a ghost wearing silver armor in this area. However, as a consolation, he invites Lisa and others to stay over for two days and witness the festival tomorrow. Alan takes up his offer instantly, and the village chief arranges for their accommodation. As Lisa sleeps in her room, she dreams about her childhood. She sees her uncle, who was a knight and her bodyguard. She was very fond of him, and he too adored her. Suddenly, her sleep is disturbed by the creaking of floorboards, and she goes outside to see if anything is happening. As Lisa takes a look outside the window, she is shocked to see a knight in silver armor that bears an uncanny similarity to her uncle. The knight begins walking away, and Lisa chases after him, eventually ending up in the cemetery. The knight vanishes, and then suddenly, zombies pop out of the ground. Lisa screams in terror, but then Alan wakes her up. It turns out that she was just having a bad dream, but the feeling of terror and loneliness has not yet left Lisa, so she clings to Alan and asks him to let her stay like this for a while. The day changes, and the next evening, the villagers dress up as ghosts to celebrate Halloween. They light a huge bonfire and dance around it, while Alan and the girls watch them. Suddenly, the white-eyed man from yesterday approaches them and asks them to join the festival. Lisa says that she is tired, so she will take a rest, but asks Betty and Alan to enjoy the festival. Alan is suspicious of foul play going on in the village, so he uses his magical eyes to quickly scan them. He then accepts Lisa's order and runs towards the dancing villagers, and Betty follows him. Just as Lisa is left alone, a strange smoke streak passes in front of her, and she suddenly hears the voice of her uncle. 
She turns around and sees him behind a crowd of masked villagers, so she eagerly runs towards him. She keeps pushing through the villagers as the night walks into the darkness. Eventually, Lisa reaches the dark forest, and the mysterious smoke becomes even more dense around her. The Silver Knight appears before her, and it is indeed her uncle. He tells her that coming to a forest at night is dangerous, but Lisa simply replies that she fears nothing because he is here with her. She recalls that he was once guarding her while she was taking a dangerous mountain route. Their carriage was attacked by monsters, so her uncle rushed outside to fend them off. He tried his best to protect Lisa, and attacked a monster targeting her. However, the monster did not die with his first strike and attacked him instead. The knight was seriously injured, and the monster grabbed him in its jaw and started flying away. The knight used all his power to stab the monster through the heart, and both of them fell down into the river below. That was the last time Lisa saw him, and because the search party never found him, she believed that he was alive somewhere. Now, she asks him where he was all this time, and the knight replies that he had been burning with hatred for the royal family while hiding and plotting his vengeance. The knight tells Lisa that her father, the king, is trying to kill her, and she struggles to believe what she just heard. Her uncle claims that the emperor is targeting people born with natural gifts. He says that those gifted people include the hero, Noel, the general who lost his life, and even Lisa, who has the power of a saintess. The knight believes that the king considers people like them to be the apostles of God who will rebel against him and destroy his country. That is why he is going to kill all of them. The knight then stretches his hand towards Lisa, asking her to join him and defeat her evil dad. Lisa is stunned by his words, but she still decides not to trust him blindly. She claims that even if what he said is true, she believes that they can resolve this issue by talking peacefully with the king. The knight realizes that the girl is not going to fall for his act, so he reveals his true nature and begins levitating using dark magic. He attacks Lisa, but then suddenly, Alan arrives there to save his girl. He blocks the knight's attack and forces him to back up. Alan reveals that he has been keeping an eye on Lisa all this time, and he knows that the knight is being controlled by a demon right now. He uses his magic powers and breaks the spell cast on the knight's body to free him from the demon's control. Lisa is worried about her uncle, but he gets up and tells her that her worries are wasted on him because he is already dead. He thanks Alan for freeing him from the spell that forced him to attack his own niece. He reveals that whatever he told Lisa about the king trying to kill her was a lie. The knight then asks Alan to take care of Lisa for her, and he promises that he will keep her safe. The knight is glad to hear that, and then he makes his last request to Alan and challenges him to spar with him once. Alan graciously accepts the challenge, and the knight rushes towards him first. Alan blocks his first attack, and then the two men exchange blows while displaying their swordsmanship skills. As Lisa sees them, she recalls how her uncle once promised to protect her from every danger in the world until a man stronger than him was ready to stand by her side. Today is the day her uncle's long wish came true, and as he lays in Lisa's lap after being defeated by Alan, he tells her to stop crying. He says that she truly was like a daughter to him, and wishes her lifelong happiness as he takes his final breath. Later that night, as Alan is watching over the village from the fortified wall, the village chief approaches him. He asks Alan how long he has known their secret, and he reveals that he knew it from the beginning. All the people in this village were dead, and the village chief was the one controlling them with magic. Alan says that despite knowing that, he didn't want to bother this peaceful village. However, the village chief does not intend to live with his mercy, because he is actually a demon. He summons out his zombies to attack him, but Alan uses his power and breaks the control of the village chief over the zombies. He then sends a flying slash that cuts the demon village chief and all his zombies into two. They disintegrate, and the village chief leaves behind a magic core. The next day, as they resume their journey, Alan analyzes the magic core and finds the powers of his younger brother in it. He believes that his younger brother was behind the reanimation of Lisa's uncle, as well as the death of the general. However, Lisa suddenly gets a message from a soldier, who tells her that the general who was supposed to be dead has suddenly returned to them, and no one can believe this news. On the other hand, Alan's younger brother, Brett, is dreaming about the day everything went downhill. It was the day his mother died, and his dad lost his heart and all the faith he had in the world. 
He became a bitter and resentful man who looked at his sons with disgust and disdain. Brett was too young to understand what his dad was going through, and got scorned by him often. The servants talked about how Brett only played around despite the loss of his mother, and compared him to Alan, who was much more mature for his age. Brett took out that resentment on Alan and blamed him for looking down on him, just like their dad. He suddenly wakes up in a cold sweat and punches his pillow in frustration over the dream. Soon, he goes to greet his father, who laughs maniacally as he reads a letter. The letter in his hand burns as he declares that it is time to start their revenge on this kingdom and on the gods themselves. Aghast by his father's reaction, Brett thinks that he is the only one suitable to lead this family. Meanwhile, rumors about the dead general returning to life start circulating in the city. Not only that, the revived general seems to have joined the rebellion against the king and is trying to convince the citizens to join his side. Captain Edward of the Royal Knights and his assistant are walking through the city, listening to the gossip and rumors. The assistant believes that the rumors were unavoidable, but they are spreading suspiciously fast. Edward also believes that someone is trying to spread the rumors deliberately, and his assistant asks him what he thinks about the general returning to life. He replies that it doesn't matter if the general is an imposter or a ghost, because if he is acting like an enemy of the kingdom, the knights will take him down. He is sure that if the general had been alive, he would have taken the same decision as him. They enter an alley, where a tall, hooded figure suddenly appears before them. Both the knights get ready to fight, but the man partially removes his hood to reveal that he is the archbishop of the church. Edward asks him what he is doing here in a dangerous place like this alone, and the archbishop replies that he wants to talk to him in secret and invites him to come with him. Edward accepts his invitation, despite the suspicions of his assistant. He claims that he is not going to fight a battle, and this is simply a trip to gather information. He leaves with the archbishop, but his assistant still cannot get over the uneasy feeling. The archbishop leads Edward to the knight's training grounds and then immediately dips. Edward is left all alone in the training area when suddenly, someone attacks him from behind. He senses the attacker's bloodlust in time and stops his attack, only to find that it is his old friend and Alan's dad, Craig. Edward repels him, and they exchange some greetings, talking about how they have not changed at all in so many years. Edward remarks that he has not seen Craig since his wife's funeral and asks him why he is suddenly here. Craig laughs while calling him a fool. He reveals that the Archbishop is already under their control and attacks Edward, who has not understood what is going on just yet. He blocks Craig's attack while demanding an explanation, and Craig declares that he no longer has any need for this world. In another location, Brett is traveling by carriage to execute their plans. However, the only thing on his mind are the memories of his mother's death. He was unable to grasp the concept of death at that time and asked Alan why their mother was not waking up. Alan simply told him that all people die one day and comforted him by holding his hand. That time, their relationship was not so bad, and Brett used to visit him when he couldn't sleep at night. He asked Alan if he was a failure because their dad had called him a failure earlier. Alan tried to convince Brett that he was not a failure and that he should not pay any attention to the people judging his worth without giving him a chance. However, he could only cry because he couldn't believe his brother's words over his dad's and ran away from Alan. Soon, he began showing growth, and their father recognized him and started treating Alan as a failure instead. Brett was happy to receive Daddy's attention, and also frustrated that, despite everyone calling him a loser, Alan paid it absolutely no mind. Brett told him that he was unworthy of their family name, but Alan told him that if he ever finds himself going down the wrong path, he should ask him for help. Brett is brought out of his nostalgia ride when a mysterious figure appears in front of him. The mystery man informs him that their preparations are complete and asks Brett to report things on his end. He replies that he has used his gift to control the Archbishop and lure Edward out. The mystery man thinks that Edward is a troublesome opponent because he can nullify any gift within a one-meter radius, and that is why he is considered invincible on the battlefield. Brett claims that his dad is already dealing with Edward, so they don't need to worry about him. If the worst-case scenario arises, he is ready to use his special ability to execute their plan without getting affected by Edward's abilities. He reminds the mystery man that his side has been producing constant failures and asks if they will succeed this time, which enrages the man. Suddenly, his partner teleports right next to him and reports that the hero has appeared. 
They disappear after warning Brett that any failures from him will not be tolerated, and he is determined to not fail like his elder brother. Meanwhile, the hero Akira and the girl Sarah, whom she adopted, are traveling through the city. Akira notices a hooded figure following them, and she quickly increases her pace. Once she reaches an isolated area, she tells her stalkers to come out of hiding, and four hooded men appear around her and declare that they will kill her. Akira doesn't think they are capable of doing that, and the attackers agree. However, they activated a spell that they had placed on Sarah and all the people in her village, turning her into a living bomb. As Akira tries to comfort the girl, the hooded men charge up their fireballs, and their leader declares that as soon as the fireballs hit the girl, her life energy will be used as fuel, and she will explode. They ask Akira if she will die with the girl or abandon her to save her life. Akira is in doubt, but then suddenly, Sarah pushes her away, telling her to run. She refuses to do so and tightly hugs the girl as the fireballs are shot towards them. On the other hand, Edward's assistant has brought some knights along with him to look after their captain, when suddenly, one of the hooded figures appears before them. The assistant forbids the knights from attacking because he can tell that the mysterious stranger is much stronger than them. However, he declares that he is not here to harm them and offers to tell them the truth about the world. In the main city, the Archbishop and the revived General, Cyril, suddenly appear before the public. They are being manipulated by Brett using his special ability. General Cyril first apologizes to the people for the confusion and panic the information about him has caused. Then he immediately moves on to his agenda and says that he will tell them the truth about this world now. The Archbishop comes forward and says that the gods are lying to them. He claims that the gifts everyone receives are not divine blessings, confusing the people. Cyril asks them to think about it. He stresses that everyone's life is directed by the gifts they receive, yet many people do not receive the gifts they truly want or deserve. The Archbishop declares that the gods are using gifts to control humans like puppets, but there is a way to escape from being their slaves. He tells everyone that if they give up their gifts, they will be free of the control of the gods and become the masters of their destinies. The people don't believe what they hear, so General Cyril says that they have someone who can answer their doubts for them. With that, Brett makes his entry and tells everyone to look behind them. They find a giant dog-like monster there and freak out upon seeing it. Brett tells them not to worry, as the monster has been artificially created by them to help them with various tasks. Cyril says that a single monster is equal to 10,000 soldiers, and it has no weakness. Everyone believes the general's words but believes that despite its abilities, the artificial creature cannot replace everyone's gifts. Brett says that his ability comes into play now. His ability is called Marionette, and the Archbishop claims that it can bring forth the true latent abilities of an individual, and even if they give up their gifts, they can become much stronger with its help. He assures that the abilities will be something that they have developed with their own will, and will lead the world into a new era of prosperity. The people start believing them now, but wonder what will happen once Brett passes away. He was also waiting for that question, and he summoned one of his hooded companions to answer it. He declares that once he passes away, his friends will help the people by giving up their gifts and embracing their hidden potential. The mysterious figure removes his hood to reveal that it is actually a demon. The crowd panics upon seeing it, but Brent assures them that he has successfully established a friendly relationship with demons. He declares that the demons were the ones who informed them about the truth about gifts, and they are the ones who can help them get rid of them. He tells everyone that they don't need gifts to live good lives, and they cheer as they accept his words as truth. Brett basks in their appreciation and thinks that they all need him. Meanwhile, the battle between Edward and Craig is coming to an end, with the knight captain on the losing side. He is certain that he has nullified Craig's gift, but he is too powerful even without it. He suddenly realizes that the source of his strength is not his gift, but his level, which Craig affirms. He declares that by leveling up, one can transcend the limits of being a human and obtain the strength to even kill gods. Edward is soon disarmed and brought to his knees, and Craig points his sword at him when suddenly, a hooded person enters the arena. Craig asks him if he has defeated the hero, but the person attacks him instead, before revealing that it is the hero Akira herself. When the demons attacked her earlier, instead of exploding, Sarah emitted a protective barrier, giving Akira the chance to finish the demons. She recalled that Alan had overwritten the curse spell on Sarah before they parted, 
and thanks to that, everything was resolved peacefully. Meanwhile, Edward's assistant also refuses the teachings that the hooded demon gave him and says that even if gifts are being used to control them, they protect the kingdom as its knights of their own will. He and his men draw their swords, but the demon simply vanishes and begins hunting down the knights one by one. Even the assistant is injured, but he is still not ready to give up on his knightly ideals just yet. Suddenly, the female knight Betty arrives there to back him up. Back at the city square, Brett is basking in the glory as the people accept him as their savior, when suddenly he hears a familiar voice asking if he is enjoying himself. He looks ahead and finds that Alan is here, and that makes all the pent-up rage inside Brett explode as he prepares to face his brother. Alan simply brings out a small holographic projector that shows visuals of Betty confronting the demon on her side. She asks the demon if they conspired with the Westfeld family and tried to assassinate General Cyril and Princess Lies. The demon affirms and Betty asks him his objective. Confident that the woman is going to die at his hands, the demon reveals his plan to her, unaware that the lowly is there, holding a device that is sharing everything he says to Alan in real time. The demon says that people who possess powerful gifts, like the General and Lies, will only get in the way of their plans. This message is heard by all the humans in the city square and Brett panics as he finds his plan being exposed. He is furious at Alan for being a nuisance to him, and loudly yells at him to not be an obstacle in their scheme. Everyone hears that, and Brett realizes that he messed up. Suddenly, Princess Lies makes her appearance and tells everyone that there was an assassination attempt on her life, and she was attacked by an artificial monster like the one they see. The people believe her, and Brett loses his mind after realizing that his plan will never succeed. He begins laughing like a maniac and tells Alan to not blame him for what he does next. He uses his marionette ability to control the knights and makes them attack the public. But Alan reacts before that and shatters the strings. The Archbishop and the General also fall unconscious as Brett's skill loses its effect over them. He screams in rage and lets his artificially created monsters loose. Everyone panics on seeing that, and while Lies directs them to a safe place, Alan looks at his brother. He thinks that if he had raised him better, he would not have turned out like this, but thinking about the past, he is certain that Brett refused all his offers for help. Now, he is determined to save his brother from becoming an irredeemable villain. Brett leaps towards him, calling him a failure while shooting his strings towards him. Alan simply grabs those strings, pulls his brother towards him, and knocks him out with just one punch. Meanwhile, Lies is comforting a crying child, and Alan asks her to take care of evacuation and other things here. He wants to stop his dad's evil plans now, but Lies is worried that it would be an emotionally wrecking battle for him. Alan remembers how coldly his dad treated him, but he still wants to stop his evil actions anyway. On the other hand, Betty is fighting the demon in the streets, the battle is confusing for the knight assistant, because all he sees are the sparks as their blades clash. Betty is taking help from Lowly and turning invisible so that the demon cannot face her. The demon realizes that he is outmatched, so he plans to withdraw, but the Lowly notices it and throws a dagger at him. Betty takes action immediately after that and delivers a fatal blow to the demon's heart. After the demon disintegrates, the assistant captain kneels before Betty and thanks her. She tells him that they have work to do, because the demons are attacking all over the city at once. She asks everyone who can still fight to save the citizens, and the assistant swears to save everyone even at the cost of their lives. Suddenly, Noel arrives there to support them with some fine weapons. On the other side, the hero Akira and Captain Edward are facing Craig, who has put both of them in the corner. He is radiating an intense dark aura, and Akira feels that he is predicting all their moves with ease. Edward tells her that Craig's gift is called Undertaker, and it allows him to see various possible futures. However, it requires too much focus and puts a lot of strain on the user's body. Edward tells Craig that his wife would not have wished for him to take such steps for power. Craig tells him that he foresaw his wife's death over and over, and no matter what he tried, he could not change that future. He felt powerless and hopeless after he lost her, and thought that her life was nothing more than a plaything for gods. Craig starts shedding tears of blood, saying that his wife Mariel's gift was called Sacred Mother, and she was supposed to give birth to the hero who will save the world. However, she gave birth to a failure like Alan, who didn't even get a gift. 
he roars, letting out red lightning from his body, asking what was the purpose of her gift and her death if she could not give birth to a hero. Now, he is determined to erase all the gifts and even the gods from the world. The red lightning disappears, and the dark aura surrounds Craig's body again. Akira tells him to stop elaborating things so much when the simple truth is that he couldn't get over his wife's death. Craig tells her she is right, and then suddenly, he begins exchanging his life force for overwhelming strength. He shoots a dark magic beam towards Akira, who counters it with her lightning bolt, and they are equally matched. However, Craig puts more power behind his attack and overwhelms the hero, blasting her away. She hits a wall and loses her consciousness, leaving only Edward behind to face Craig. Edward has realized that Craig is using the power of demons and tells him to stop using it before he loses all sense of himself. Craig doesn't care about his opinion and hits him with the dark beam too. Edward feels the darkness suffocating and swallowing him, and then he suddenly finds himself in a world where Craig's painful memories are displayed as black bubbles rising out of a sea. He begins crying and apologizes to his friend for not understanding his pain, and suddenly, the dark aura surrounding Craig vanishes. Edward believes that he saved him through the power of friendship, but then Craig stabs him in the heart. He falls dead with that, and Akira is aghast by what she just saw. She yells at Craig, saying that his friend was thinking about him till the last moment, but he doesn't care about it anymore. He tells her it is her turn to die next, and shoots a dark beam at her. Akira prepares to be sent to the afterlife, but the attack doesn't hit her. When she opens her eyes, she finds Alan standing in front of her, and Craig is not happy that his failure of a son is here to stand in his way. Alan also replies that he would have preferred someone else to do this job. Craig gathers his dark aura, telling his son that he will always be an eyesore to him. He shoots the dark beam at him, but Alan blocks it all easily. Craig is stunned because the attack was powered by his hatred, and he believes that his hatred can't be countered so easily. He asks Alan who the hell he is, and he replies that he is a failure. But even then, there are people he cannot abandon, and his mom would have wanted him to help everyone too. Alan unleashes a radiant aura, but Craig is ever more angry at him and asks him to not take his wife's name. His hatred and darkness begins overwhelming his body, and he shoots an intense dark beam towards Alan, who finds it hard to block. Suddenly, Alan finds himself in the sea of his father's grief and senses his bottomless despair. He sees the memories of his mother's death and funeral, and those of his birth too. This is the first time Alan realizes how much his parents loved each other, but despite this, he will not let his dad destroy the world. He unleashes his full power and dispels all the darkness surrounding him. He then uses his special move and summons multiple ethereal swords and sends them towards Craig. Craig takes a direct hit from the powerful attack, but he still looks fine at the first glance. However, he suddenly starts trembling, and then the severe damage he received brings him down to his knees. He coughs blood on his battered sword, and then yells at Alan, calling him a failure. He lets his power go into overdrive mode, and releases all of it at once, creating a tornado around him. His power creates dark clouds in the sky that grow and engulf the entire sky. The city turns dark and the people panic, anticipating the end of the world. However, Lies asks everyone to keep calm and trust Alan. In the training arena, Craig is still releasing an insane amount of dark energy, and Akira says that this is beyond human abilities. Alan says that he has no choice but to stop his dad now. He begins releasing his full power gradually while running towards his dad. He catches speed and then uses one of his ultimate attacks called Flash and charges towards Craig with his entire body covered with dense magic. His piercing attack collides with the dark tornado, sending droplets of dark energy flying everywhere. Alan keeps drilling through his dad's defenses, when suddenly, dark tentacles appear from the tornado and latch onto him. He finds himself in his dad's mind, with nothing but a dark sphere in front of him. He hears groaning sounds from the sphere and realizes that it is his dad, being held prisoner by his rage. Alan realizes that he was not much different from his dad, because he was also running from the betrayals of his past life all this time. In a way, he can understand what it is like to be a prisoner of negative emotions. That is why he decides to free his dad. He stabs the dark sphere, and suddenly, a bright pillar of light appears in front of him. The pillar of light begins expanding, gobbling up everything in its path, 
And with that, the darkness surrounding Craig in the real world subsides. Then, with a green light, he appears again, severely injured. A mystically glimmering butterfly descends towards him, and just as it perches on his hand, Craig's body starts to crumble down. As he is reduced to nothing, Craig finally accepts that his failure of a son has finally accepted his destiny. He cries, taking his wife's name as the last words he ever speaks before the mystic butterfly guides him to the afterlife. Soon after that, Alan visits the king, who grants him the title of the Duke of Westfelt for his great services in the recent battle. However, Alan respectfully declines the reward, and the king accepts it. As he walks back to his office, his assistant asks him if he was sure to let the boy go. The king remembers holding the young lies in his arms, who excitedly told him about Alan. He thinks that the boy saved the country and his dear daughter, so this is the least he can do for him. Meanwhile, Alan is preparing to leave with Noel and the lowly when Lies comes running there and asks them to let her take her along. They are surprised because a princess should not leave the palace without reason, but Lies informs them that she is now Lies Westfelt and will look after that territory. Alan has no choice but to accept her on hearing that. Noel then asks her about Betty and Lies says that she is a guard of the royal family. However, now Lies is not an immediate member of the royal family, so she cannot serve her. Despite that, Betty is trying her best to find a loophole to serve her. Alan asks her if she will be fine without her, and Lies claims that she feels much safer with him around. With that, they get on the carriage and depart for their new life. However, little do they know that there is another person in this world with powers like Alan, and she knows him too. She wonders why he reincarnated in this world, and decides to find out soon enough. Alan sees a dream of his past life, in which the winged angel apologizes to him while he is on his deathbed. She cries, saying that she didn't make him a hero thinking that he would end like this, and thanks him for saving the world, before asking what his final request was. He wakes up from the dream with that, and heads downstairs, where Lisa is preparing breakfast for him. As soon as Alan sits down, Noel comes there, scantily clad and Lisa freaks out on seeing her in her underwear. Alan tells her to at least wear something before coming here, and she just winks, saying that he has seen her even more vulnerable. Lisa freaks out and rattles him, demanding an explanation. He explains things as they sit down to eat, and says that Noel's workshop was too hot so she had just taken off some clothes, and that was the end of it. Noel then reminds him that he has to help her test out some new weapons, and Lisa says that he has to help her do some paperwork as well. He has even promised the lowly to take a nap with her, and Alan freaks out because he forgot about all those promises. Suddenly, a dog-eared girl from the Adventurer's Guild comes for him, because there is a mountain of requests for him. She begins dragging him along, but Lisa and others stop them. They begin fighting among each other to get the right to spend time with Alan and he is embarrassed by the attention he is suddenly getting. He manages to do everything but gets too exhausted because of it. Later, he tells everyone that he is planning to travel to the nearby empire for a change of pace, and if he finds a good place on the way, he will settle down there permanently. Lisa is not happy about that, while Noel tells Loli about the Victor Empire, which is a powerhouse country that is on friendly terms with their kingdom. It is famous for its multiple dwarven smiths, and Noel decides to come with Alan to see the Empire. Even the lowly says that she will come along, and Noel manages to convince Alan to let them join them. Lisa, however, has to stay back to manage the duchy. Well, she calls Betty and ditches the work on her, so that she can also join Alan on his journey. On the way, Noel asks her if it is really fine for her to leave the duchy to travel, and Lisa says that she needs to visit the Empire to confirm some things. Even though the Empire is on friendly terms with them, the Emperor is ambitious and would have attacked them during the chaos a few months back. However, they did nothing, and she wants to see what they are plotting as the new Duchess of Westfeld. Soon, their carriage passes through a rough mountain road, and Noel complains, asking if they can't take a smoother route. Suddenly, Alan stops the carriage, because he just spotted some monsters called Sand Wolves up ahead. Noel and Loli talk about how ferocious those monsters are, but Alan immediately leaps towards them and destroys them within seconds. He returns to the carriage, but now he is doubtful that someone sent the sand wolves after them on purpose. A couple days later, they reach the first major city of the Empire. 
Despite it being bustling with activity, Alan is on his guard because he feels that the atmosphere here is a bit intimidating because there are too many guards. Suddenly, he bumps into a redhead and immediately recognizes her as Hina. Even she recognizes him and asks what he is doing in a place like this. He throws the question at her and asks what is the daughter of the Imperial Marquis doing here without her guards. She gets embarrassed and tells him to unhand her, and he does so. Alan's girls are jealous that he is close with Hina, but Lisa recognizes her. She also recognizes her and asks what is she doing here, and Lisa nervously lies that they are sightseeing, but is easily caught. Hina doesn't ask her any questions, but gives everyone advice that the Empire is in a state of chaos and confusion right now, and a single spark may lead to disaster. That is why, she wants Alan and his girls to head back to their country before they get caught in trouble. She reveals that even the Black Wolf Knights, who are the most feared knights in the Empire, have been given the right to take action on their own by the Emperor. Hina tells them to stay away from the Black Wolf Knights at all costs, and then immediately takes her leave. Lisa and others are confused about what is going on here, but Alan notices something so he decides to pursue Hina, leaving his girls behind. Alan catches up to Hina, who was actually the winged angel from his dream. She was the disciple of gods in their last life who kept on telling him what to do. He asks her if she warned them earlier as Hina or as the angel, and she replies that she was just being herself, because this time, her powers are quite limited. Alan says that it is a surprise that she also ended up in this world, and Hina blushes as she says that it is because he keeps attracting trouble everywhere he goes, so she came here to support him. She tells him to hurry home if he wants to live peacefully, and he simply leaves after thanking her. While he is searching for his girls, an explosion happens in the distance, so he goes to check it out. He finds a man running away from the guards and coming right at him. The wanted man draws his sword as he tells Alan to get aside, and he simply taps him on the back and knocks him down. Suddenly, the man is surrounded by black smoke and a magic circle appears behind his back. Blood splatters from every opening in his body, and the man dies instantly. Immediately, the knights come there, and their captain is curious about the situation and Alan's presence there. He raises his hands as the knight captain interrogates him. She wants to know what happened here, and Alan says that he hit the man in self-defense, but he did not kill him. The knight captain finds it hard to believe him, and asks how could he kill the man so brutally without using a weapon or a gift. She explains that her gift allows her to see what gifts others have used. The downside of that gift is that she cannot see if demons are involved in something. Alan tells her that he is not a demon, but he knows that the girl isn't going to believe him so easily. She affirms, saying that if he can't give her solid proof, she will arrest him on suspicions of being a demon. When the night captain tries to grab him, he suddenly turns invisible, and she panics, she sends her knights to lock the border and search for Alan everywhere. Meanwhile, Alan was rescued thanks to Loli's help, who brings him to a sewer where Hina, Lisa and Noel are waiting for him. Hina is angry that he got into trouble despite her warning, but he is confused about what she is doing with his girls. Lisa explains that they were waiting for him to return when Hina approached them and told the Loli to help him. Alan understands everything and states that since Loli's gift is demonic in nature, the night captain failed to capture her. He gives her a head pat for doing her job well, and then suggests that they immediately leave the Empire. Hina tells him that all the borders and gates have been sealed, so they can't escape. Even the Loli's power can't help them, because the knights will be on their guard this time. Alan then starts staring at Hina and says that maybe she can help them. She takes everyone to her home, where the butler recognizes Alan. He too recognizes the butler Silas, who used to serve their family before he was kicked out by his crazy dad. Silas tells Alan that Hina hired him and everyone else that was kicked from the family, and she gets flustered. They head inside after that, where Noel and Loli keep bouncing on the couch. Alan gets straight to the point and asks her what's wrong with the Empire. Hina tells them that over one year ago, the Emperor was assassinated, and Lisa realizes that is why the Empire did not try to invade them. Noel asks Hina if it is all right for her to reveal such crucial information to outsiders, and she replies that she trusts they are not people who will misuse this information. They retire to their rooms, and Hina pays Alan a visit at night. He asks her if she suspects the demons are behind the assassination, and she agrees. 
She believes that only demons or Alan can pass through the king's guards to kill him, and he says that she can do that too. Hina claims that there is no merit for her in doing that. Alan then asks since when has she been watching over him, because otherwise she wouldn't have hired the butler and others, and not met him immediately after he entered the empire. Hina says that it was just a coincidence and leaves for her room. Once she exits Alan's room, she is glad that she saw his smile after what seemed like forever. In their past life, she served by his side as the disciple of gods. She saw Alan turn sad because of the hate he received from everyone, and that is why she decided to reincarnate in this world to ensure that he lives happily here. Hina has been watching over Alan since forever, and she was happy that he met people who kept him happy, even though she is jealous that she was not among them. Soon, Alan's party settles in Hina's castle, but Noel starts throwing a tantrum because she is bored. She wants to see the dwarven workshops the Empire is so famous for, but Hina tells her to give up on that because the city is under strict guards right now. This deals a severe blow to Noel's mental health, and she starts forging an invisible blade out of her imagination. Alan remarks that the Black Wolf Knights are only after him, so Noel should be fine even if she goes out. Even Hina attests to that, and Noel is super excited now. The next day, she and the lowly head out into the city and explore various blacksmith shops before trying out some street food. Noel suddenly notices that there are a lot of elves here, and all of them are staring at her. She becomes delusional that they think she is cute, and starts imagining how she will sign autographs for them. However, as they approach her, Loli takes action, and drags Noel away from them, acting as her bodyguard. Once they return to Hina's home, Noel is exhausted, but she is also happy that she is quite popular. Hina tells her that she is popular among the elves, but not for the reason she thinks. She tells Noel to follow her if she wants to know the reason for her popularity, and the entire group tags along. They reach the empty courtyard, where Hina uses her divine powers, and with a bright flash of light, everyone is teleported to a forest. Everyone is stunned, and then Hina tells them that this is the forest of elves, and Noel can learn more about herself here. Lisa remarks that they were just at the castle right now, and Hina explains that they are at the same place, but in a different dimension. She boasts that the Forest of Elves is protected by a strong barrier because they don't like outsiders. Anyone who visits them has their memory wiped clean, but Hina has the permission to enter the forest freely. Alan is surprised that the elves could create a barrier so strong that even he couldn't detect it, and asks Hina if she was involved in it somehow. She nervously admits that she was a small part of it, and then begins leading the group inside. They head deep into the forest, and Noel remarks that she feels like she belongs here, but she has no memories of this place. Soon, they find themselves surrounded by elves. Everyone is on their guard as the elves come closer, but Alan cannot sense any hostile intention from them. Suddenly, the elves get on their knees, and Hina says that it is the obvious reaction because their ruler has returned. The elves welcome their ruler back home, and Noel stammers as she asks them if they are talking about her. One elf says that they have waited for her for a long time, but Noel still doesn't understand what is going on. After Hina affirms that she indeed is the last remaining elf with the blood of the royal family, she finally realizes her position. The elf from before introduces himself as Percival, the representative of the king, and once again welcomes Noel and her friends to the forest. He invites them to their settlement, which is a bunch of tree houses. The elves are using human furniture as well as playing chess, and this surprises Alan and others. Percival is about to explain that Hina brought all these things for them, but she tells him to shut up. Soon, two horned kids come running to Noel and offer her some acorns they picked. She takes one from each, and the kids promise to bring her more amazing things tomorrow. Percival tells the kids to scram, and even asks the one hiding behind the trees to come out. The boy named Phil comes out of hiding, and Percival tells him to go away because their ruler is busy. Noel says that she has time to talk to him, but Percival doesn't agree to that. Phil complains that the other kids talked with the ruler even though they are bad people. Percival loudly scolds him for being a racist piece of shit, and the boy runs away crying. Noel is curious about what he meant by bad people, but Percival says that it was nothing and starts leading the group inside. Meanwhile, in the human world, the knight Captain Lazit, who picked a fight with Alan earlier, sneaks out of a building. She is greeted by her rude subordinate Oswald, 
whom she sent on a mission to find the Forest of Elves. He reports that he failed, and Lizzie lectures him about being a bloodthirsty battle junkie. He throws the same insult back at her, and she places her sword at his neck. Oswald doesn't even care and returns to his mission. Back in the Forest of Elves, everyone is enjoying a party, with Noel being the center of attention. Percival sits next to Alan and begins talking about how odd the time was for the elves without their ruler. He explains that if elves do not serve their rulers, they can neither grow nor bear children. Percival credits Hina for bringing hope into the lives of the elves by telling him about Noel. Not only that, Hina also took it upon herself to introduce the reclusive elves to other cultures. She brought them human items, and the elves began to understand humans better because of that. Thanks to that, many elves freely visit the human world. Alan asks if Hina was the one who brought the Horn children to the village too. He knows that they are demon children, but assures Percival that he doesn't bear any hatred towards demons in his heart. However, he is curious about how demons, who are hated all over the world, live peacefully with the shy elves. Percival explains that three years ago, Hina suddenly asked them to take care of the two orphan demon kids. Most elves were not in favor of that, but Hina told them that if they lived alongside other races, they would grow even without their king. That's why everyone agreed to let the demon kids stay here, but most of them still don't accept them. Later, Noel is exhausted because of all the unwanted attention she got, and she is not happy about how unreasonable the elves were while trying to convince her. Loli nervously asks her if she is really going to become the ruler of the elves, and she replies that she has no idea about it at the moment. Seeing the atmosphere turn too gloomy, Alan suggests that they should take some rest now, but signals Hina to meet him later. Noel is left alone in the living room, wondering about her decision. She achieved her mentor Vanessa's ambition by forging the ultimate sword, and now she has no goal of her own. Burdened by her confusion, Noel decides to take a walk in the fresh air. As she stares at the moon, Alan is watching over her from the window. Just then, Hina visits him and asks if the gesture earlier was to call her to his bedroom. She asks him to be gentle with her because this is her first time, and as she pouts for a kiss, Alan tells her that she can go now as he is done with her. Hina is furious and lashes out at him for leading her on, and after she settles down, she asks him what he wants. Alan says that he wants to know about the demon kids. Hina first curses Percival for being so loose-lipped, and then tells Alan that there are a few things about demons that he doesn't know yet. First of all, demons aren't even a distinct race. When a person is overcome with hatred for other people, and they wish everyone else to be dead, the will of the world recognizes them as a demon. However, demon kids are exceptions, because they are born to demon parents, who almost always abandon them. They are hated and hunted down the moment they come into this world, and that is why their hatred and demonic attributes grow. The demon kids kill to survive and become stronger, continuing an evil cycle of hatred. Hina says that she found the two kids when they were being chased by humans, and she couldn't just let them be, so she rescued them. Alan smiles at her, and remarks that it is exactly what he thought she would do. The next day, Percival leads Noel and her friends to a mystic lake inside the forest. Noel seems to be out of it, and Hina asks her if she is too troubled about making a decision. She asks her not to be guilt-tripped into becoming the ruler of the elves, because they are figuring out how to live on their own. Just then, the two demon children come there and gift Noel a sparkling stone like they had promised. She thanks them, and then Hina remarks that it is a spirit stone, a crystallization of elven power, which is a precious ingredient in alchemy. Suddenly, the boy Phil comes there and throws the spirit stone away. He tells the demon kids to stay away from their ruler, and they start crying. As Noel tries to console them, Percival scolds the racist piece of shit, but he runs away. Alan realizes that the elves deeply hate demons, and Hina retorts that not just elves, but even someone as kind as Lisa is having problems approaching the kids. Hina then walks away and finds Phil crying in the streets of the human city. She says that he was quite mean earlier, and he replies that he couldn't stand the demons getting close to the rulers. Hina asks him if the demons have ever done anything bad to him, and he says that they have not. She sits beside him and tells him that the demon kids feel the same way about the ruler as he does. She tells Phil that he should try to be friends with the kids and treat them nicely because they are younger than him. She walks away, telling the boy to return home soon as well. 
Phil realizes that he must agree to the demon kids, but as soon as he gets up, he finds the mean knight Oswald in front of him. He tries running away, but Oswald grabs him by the neck and then unleashes his sword, asking Phil to show him the way to the elven forest. Meanwhile, in the village of elves, a grand fest is thrown in honor of their ruler. While everyone is amazed by the hospitality of elves and enjoying themselves, Noel looks gloomy for some reason. Hina asks Alan if Noel will be alright, because she looks like the thought of becoming a ruler has taken a toll over her. Alan is busy stuffing his mouth, and remarks that anyone in her position would lose their appetite too. Hina wants to help Noel somehow, but Alan replies that it is something she must decide for herself. However, their worries are completely baseless, as the only reason Noel is not interested in food is because she wants to eat meat and not the fruits and vegetables. Later, Hina decides to take her leave, and entrusts Percival to show the guests around. Percival says that she has no need to go out herself to look for the missing person, but she assures him that it is time for her to return home as well, so it won't be a problem for her. She leaves with that, and Alan asks Percival if something is the matter. He replies that the boy named Phil has left the forest and not yet returned. In the city, Hina looks for Phil in the streets, but she is unable to find him anywhere. On the other hand, Alan and his friends have returned to the elf settlement, and he remarks that elves are really carefree. Lowly looks around and says that they seem more lazy than carefree. Percival replies that the word hardworking doesn't suit elves well because they live too long and grow too slowly. The way they experience time is also different from other races. That is why hard work becomes infinitely less rewarding for them. Lowly asks Percival how do elves get food if they don't work, and he simply stretches his hand and an apple appears there. Everyone is curious to know the secret behind his trick, and he explains that whenever they wish for it, the forest shares its bountiful products with them, because elves are part of the forest. Neither Lisa nor Noel can fully grasp this concept, but Alan uses his magic eyes to find that elves and the forest have the same energy signature, and Percival is impressed by him. After explaining more about the connection between the forest and elves, Percival asks Noel what she thinks about the forest. She replies that it is nice and peaceful, but it lacks something. Alan suddenly chimes in and asks Percival if he can live in the forest too. He tells Lisa that he was always planning to find a peaceful place to live, and there can be nothing better than this. Percival replies that to live here, Alan would have to prove that he is one of them, and he can't even tell him how to do it, because it is the forest that decides everything. Alan says that he really wants to stay in the village, and Percival apologizes because he can't break the rules for anyone. Noel then asks him about the demon children, and he replies that they are just looking after them for a short while. He believes that once they grow up a bit, the children will leave. Alan finds the loophole in the law, and asks Percival if he can also stay in the village for a short time. He believes that it would be fine, and then Alan asks him what is their definition of a short time. Percival says that it would be about a hundred years, and Lisa freaks out on hearing that. Suddenly, the wind starts blowing and Percival receives a message from the forest. Alan is curious, and Percival tells him that they have a visitor, but it is someone the forest doesn't recognize. Loli asks if it is someone suspicious, but he tells her to not be nervous because there are many people in the Empire who can enter their forest through legal means. He then apologizes to Noel, stating that he must pause their tour now, because he must receive their guest. Noel tells him that she has no problem, and then Percival departs. After that, Alan suggests that they should return to the village, but Noel wants to explore the forest. However, he reasons that it will be bad if they run into someone from the Empire, and she understands. They go back to their lodging and Noel plays chess with Loli, who has her own set of rules. Meanwhile, Lisa asks Alan if he really plans on staying in the forest, and he replies that he is seriously considering it. This makes her jealous, and she pouts, saying that of course he wants to stay here because his dear Hina is here. Alan understands her jealousy, but assures her that his relationship with Hina is not what she thinks it is. Lisa is not happy with that response and asks him to give her the details, and he nervously says that it is hard to explain. He says that it is like he and Hina are stuck together because of fate, and this gives Lisa the wrong ideas once again. On the other hand, Hina returns to her mansion, where she finds Lizette, the captain of the Black Wolf Knights waiting for her. Hina asks her what she is doing here, 
and Lizard says that they've received information that she is hiding a suspect in the Emperor's assassination case. Hina plays it cool and says that she has no idea what Lizard is talking about and asks who fed her this bullshit. Lizzie replies that it was just a hunch because she found the suspect in the city a few days ago, but then he escaped. However, he didn't cross the border and there are no clues that lead to him. She declares that the only one capable of making this happen is Hina, and on that cue, the knights storm her house. They begin tearing through the house to search for the suspect or any clues. Lizit says that they may not find anything here, but she believes that the suspect is hiding in the forest of the elves, and Hina goes there often. Hina is nervous on hearing this. Meanwhile, the knight vice captain has reached the forest with Phil, and he plans to play it rough now. Soon Percival arrives there to welcome the guest, but as he sees the scared Phil, he realizes that that man used the boy to make his way in here. The knight named Oswald spits out an apple he was eating, and then turns to Percival, asking if he is the boss here. Percival recognizes him as one of the Black Wolf Knights Hina had warned him about. She had told him that the Black Wolf Knights have been given extrajudicial rights, and they can kill anyone without any reason or accountability. Percival introduces himself to Oswald, and asks him to state his business, and Oswald says that the knights suspect the elves of harboring a criminal. Percival says that he has no idea who he is talking about, but Oswald is high on his authority and yells that if he said the culprit is here, he grabs Percival's collar when he tries to talk sense to him, but then suddenly, the demon children come there. They think that Oswald is just another guest, and offer some fruits to him, and he recognizes them as demons. Percival tries to shield them, but the knight shoves him out of the way and laughs, saying that he came looking for a criminal but found some demons instead. Percival begs him to not do anything to the kids, but Oswald snaps his fingers and causes a giant explosion. Noel feels it because of her connection with the forest, and then takes out the spirit stones that the demon children gave her. The stones are glowing, and Noel believes that the kids might be in danger. Alan asks her what happened and she tells him that a scene just flashed through her mind, and she saw the Black Wolf Knights attacking the Demon Boys. She declares that this is unforgivable, and rushes to help them. Lowly joins her, and Alan is left behind, thinking about how he always wanted to save everyone in the past, but not everyone wanted to be saved by his hand, and it created a hole in his heart. Suddenly, Lisa snaps him out of his thoughts, and he decides to head out to support Noel. In the forest, Percival somehow shielded the kids from the explosion using a barrier, and he asks Oswald to leave the forest because the children are innocent. He doesn't care because being born as demons is their greatest sin. Percival tells the kids to stay behind him, and then tries attacking Oswald with his barrier. He just laughs while backing away, and decides to test him. He snaps his finger, and makes the tree behind Percival explode, sending him rolling forward. Percival is defeated, and then Oswald goes to execute the two terrified demons. Phil comes between them to protect the kids, and Oswald decides to kill him first. However, before he can swing his sword, a hammer hits the back of his head, and he turns around to see Noel there. As everyone calls her the queen, Oswald gets the idea that she is their leader, but Noel insists that she is just a swordsmith. She tells the knight to get out of the forest, and he decides to deal with her too. He snaps his fingers to explode a tree near her, but Loli notices his trick in time and moves Noel to safety. Oswald keeps snapping his fingers to cause explosions, and Loli and Noel can only run, while complaining that Alan is taking too long. On the other hand, Percival fears that Noel may be harmed, so he manifests a sword using magic and charges at Oswald. The knight is too fast for him, and he easily dodges his attack before kicking him away. He is about to strike down Percival, but then Alan arrives there and blocks his sword. He gripes that just when he found the most peaceful place to live, some idiots come to disturb it, before flicking Oswald away. The knight asks him to identify himself, and Alan says that giving his name away would take longer than the actual fight. Oswald can't tolerate the insult and he tries to attack him, but Alan uses his magic eyes to defuse his power. He decides to target Noel in that case, and sets up an invisible chain between his hand and her. He snaps and sends a flame towards her, but Alan cuts it off. Oswald is shocked because Alan can see through his ability, but he yells that the fight is not over. He draws his sword and rushes towards him furiously, but Alan instantly appears behind him. Before he can give him his punishment, 
He asks the knight why was he trying to kill the two boys. He replies that he doesn't need any reason to kill demons, and attacks Alan, who dodges and strikes him back, ending the battle swiftly. Later, Lisa heals Phil, and he goes to play with the demon kids who have become his friends now. Lisa then tells Alan that she was very happy when he saved the demon kids. She talks about how kids are born without sin, no matter which race they are born in, and he thanks her for her kind words. Meanwhile, Loli is checking up on the unconscious Oswald, and Noel wonders what they should do now. She believes that defeating a knight is like declaring war on the Empire, and Alan remarks that Hina will scold them like an old granny when she learns this. Coincidentally, Hina arrives there just then, and everyone panics as they try explaining the situation to her. She sighs before lecturing Alan just like he predicted, and then says that she will deal with the aftermath. She also has good news for everyone as the roads leading out of the city have finally been opened again. She tells everyone to hurry home, but Alan seems to be taken aback by this news. Later, Percival bids farewell to Noel, asking if she is sure that she doesn't want to live in the forest with the rest of the elves. She replies that there is so much she doesn't know about being a ruler. Noel says that if she keeps traveling with her friends, she will see the world and become more suitable to become a ruler. Percival says that they will always be waiting for her, and then Noel and friends wave everyone goodbye, promising to be back someday. However, little do they know of the trouble haunting Hina now. She has been arrested on suspicion of assassinating the Emperor, because of a deal she made with Lizzet to ensure Alan's safety. If you liked this video, make sure to subscribe for part 10, and make sure to check out this brand new anime about a loser who gets reincarnated as a prince with godly abilities.